uh, the next panel on California Freshworks, Social Investment for Healthier Communities, is another example of the California Endowment's uh, leadership. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Tina Castro, who's the Director of uh, Mission-Related Investments uh, for the California Endowment. And what she focuses on are investments that al align strong financial returns with meaningful uh, social impact. Uh, prior to the endowment, uh, Tina was an invest in the investment management division of Goldman Sachs. She has a master's in uh, both industrial relations uh, and in finance. Tina Castro. So let me just first check, can you all hear me all right? All right, so thank you so much for having us. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, we're looking forward to the conversation and hopefully providing a little bit of a different perspective um, on the topic of discussion for the day than maybe what you've heard throughout the day. As you see from your agenda, we're gonna be talking about the California Freshworks Fund as a case study and example of what is a for-profit market-based intervention to a social challenge and in uh, the focus of today's conversation, how that fund tries to address the issue of poverty. Um, it is really principally ar around creating increased access to healthy food as a means to help improve health outcomes, but also about helping to drive economic development benefits, principally the creation of jobs in communities that really need some. And so I am very fortunate to be sitting up here with my esteemed colleague, um, Kat Howard, who is the Director of Healthy Food Programs at NCB Capital Impact and is responsible for managing the Freshworks Fund at NCB. NCB is a community development financial institution who serves as the fund manager for the California Freshworks Fund. I apologize, I have my back to you all back there. <laughs> um, we have Jose Osuna, or Osuna? Osuna. Osuna, who um, is uh, with Homeboy Industries, and forgive me, I'm just gonna double check, uh, Director of Employment Services with Homeboy Industries who's uh, gonna be talking to us a little bit about the, uh, one of the partnerships that we have with, between the Freshworks Fund and Homeboy Industries. Daniel Talalian, who is a principal with Emerging Markets. Emerging Markets serves as what we call the food access organization for the Freshworks Fund. Essentially the business development arm for the fund. They're the folks who go out and try and find the transactions and the deals that the fund can finance. And we have Mary Lee, a deputy director with PolicyLink, uh, who works on their health team who's been a key advisor to us in the development of the fund and in the deployment of the fund, um, and how we can really ensure that the capital that's available through the fund is having the kind of impact that we wanna see it have on health and in the communities that we're working in. So thank you all so much for joining us. I'm gonna start with Kat. Kat, I'm gonna ask you to maybe just spend a few minutes um, talking about what exactly the California Freshworks Fund is so that folks have a little bit of an overview before we launch into uh, a little bit of a deeper discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Freshworks Fund is a grant and loan fund that has brought together over $270 million from both mission-driven and um, capital market investors with the idea of investing in new grocery stores, um, fresh food retail, and innovation in fresh food retail and distribution, um, impacting low-income people and low-income communities. So basically, it, what we do with the money that we have put together is we make loans and grants to grocers and to nonprofits that are working in the grocery industry um, and other types of organizations that are interested in increasing people's access to food in low-income areas. Typically, we're working in communities that are, um, you may have heard the word food desert. We typically more use the words low access, or Tina likes to call them opportunity areas. Um, but they are, are typically um, communities that have seen a lot of disinvestment over the years. So um, there may not be places to buy healthy, fresh food that are accessible to the, the residents, whether that be walking or driving. Um, and so uh, fresh food is, is a difficult thing to come by for many families in the, living in the communities. What we do with Freshworks is we invest with with grocers and other organizations that are interested in bringing healthy food retail to communities that have seen little investment. As Tina mentioned, not only do we see an increase um, in the availability of healthy foods through this, but there are other really important impacts as well, which we're also in investing in as well. So the, uh, the economic, economic development impacts, jobs, 
um, you know, grocery stores, typically a, a 40,000 square foot grocery store can hire anywhere from 100 to 150 people. Um, you see economic development in terms of the tax base um, for the community, um, as well as things like, you know, eliminating blight, just a, a new development, all those other ancillary uh, benefits. Um, and then we're also trying to, to spark innovation within um, food retail and food uh, production and distribution. Um, some of the things that we've been doing has been investing in, in partnerships um, with Homeboy, for example, um, to see uh, if we can get partnerships with uh, job training programs to go into co to communities and um, provide potential applicants for stores. Um, we're also looking at different uh, types of opportunities, such as mobile markets, as a way to connect with communities that may not be able to necessarily support a full-fledged store. So it's a lot of different ways of investing in healthy food and innovation and trying to bring both access to healthy foods and employment and other opportunity, economic development opportunities to low-income communities. And Kat, did you mention how much capital is committed to the fund? $272 million. <laughs> and, and, and I think the important thing to, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail here, is, is that it's really a combination of funds. So it's um, mission-driven investors, such as the endowment, um, such as Kaiser Permanente, such as Dignity Health, which is formerly Health, Catholic Healthcare West. Um, but it is also a lot of capital from the capital markets as well. So we have a number of bank investors. We have a, um, an investor that's a, an insurance company that are all coming together and saying that this is a social outcome that they're looking to invest in um, and how to best go about that by pooling together funds that are, are coming from both kind of the capital side, the capital market side, and the mission side. And so thank you. And I kid around about the amount of capital, but the reason I think it's relevant to the conversation is because I think, you know, we're talking about the fund as sort of a market-based for-profit intervention. And I think what you get with that kind of an approach is a scale that sometimes you're not able to achieve strictly through a grant-making approach or strategy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's worth just kind of highlighting that a bit. So thanks. So that gives us a little bit of, of perspective on what the fund is. I'm going to um, move over to Mary, and maybe Mary, you can give us a little bit of a broader kind of context about the, the food system and how the food system serves as sort of an access point or entree to not only good health, but economic development and that's exactly what I want to talk about <laughs> because I think particularly I've been here all day and it's been an amazing discussion but after all of the speakers and particularly the folks that focused on the legislative side and the policy side you might be wondering if we were talking about combating childhood poverty why we're talking about grocery stores all of a sudden it might seem like a bit of a leap and I think what I want to underscore is that the food systems working on our food systems of which grocery retail is one aspect, it's really an arena that has the potential to improve the quality of lives of children, to raise them out of poverty uh, in a multitude of ways. And the health aspect is probably the most obvious. You know, we know that everybody in the nation right now is really combating obesity. It's a huge epidemic. But children of color and low-income kids are really hurt worse than anybody else. Um, the disparities are stunning. And we can talk about it as obesity, but I think what it really is is malnutrition. Um, so people are likely to be low income, people of color, and are also the most likely in that instance to be in the food deserts that Kat talked about. The, uh, the flip side of that coin is that folks are not only living in food deserts, which are places where it's really difficult to find access to healthy food uh, that's affordable, that's high quality, that's a good variety, and that's close to you, but they're probably also living in something that's called a food swamp, where there's a lot of very dangerous food. It's uh, salty and sugary and highly processed. It's cheap, it's filling, but it's very, very bad for you. Um, and so we have those health consequences of our current food system, which is the, the consequence on the individual. And those consequences are actually deadly. It's not just about a, a question of convenience or a question about uh, trying to keep uh, your appearance a certain way. Folks who are living with the consequences of limited health access, I'm sorry, food access, are suffering from diabetes, from heart disease. Their lives are shorter, and the quality of those lives is compromised by their, their food issues and the health challenges that result in it. So the, this raises a, an equity question, too, because, again, we are seeing uh, two-tiered food structures and food systems. 
both from the perspective of the consumer and also from the perspective of employees and business owners. Those low-income folks of color who are living in places where they're probably having difficulties getting access to healthy food are probably in jobs that are related to the food industry. Here in LA County, I think uh, one in seven jobs is related in some way to the, to the food system. It's a huge economic engine and yet people of color and low-income folks and particularly children who come from households where that's their, their parents' circumstance are not seeing this as a system that's working for them. So when we talk about mission-driven investment, when we talk about using a different type of a paradigm to change our food system, we actually have the ability to touch the lives of folks who right now aren't seeing a way to shift out of poverty. So we talked before in the um, earlier presentations about why we needed to address the problems of child poverty. This gives us some real concrete ways to think about how to do it. Um, and it's really good news. It's really good news, frankly, a great opportunity to take this major system um, of our economy. Uh, again, Los Angeles, probably a better example than many places where we have so much in the way of um, agriculture in the way of food retail, everything from f restaurants, uh, food carts, um, community gardens, all of these sorts of, of, of um, food outlets, which can be a source of jobs and small business opportunities. And so the question is whether we can find a way to have this investment support these new strategies that not only bring better quality food to our city, to our region, but employ and revitalize the neighborhoods where low-income folks live. I just want to put a little pin in that economic revitalization point, too, because we sometimes miss that point that, you know, really, if you're low-income folks, particularly people of color, who are living in neighborhoods, these neighborhoods are so segregated. We have a deplorable history in our nation of um, segregation, discrimination, and oppression. And when you look at our neighborhoods, we see that they frankly have been laid out physically to, co to correlate with that history. And so they're sort of disadvantaged by design, if you will. Um, how do you reverse that? How do you make those neighborhoods contain all the elements that a healthy community needs? And you need something specific and something tangible to do it. So when you're making a decision about whether you upgrade a store, whether you put in a restaurant that begins to create vibrancy in a community, whether you present preventing leakage, people don't have to leave their neighborhood to go shopping, you're creating a tax base. All of these things are part of how you revitalize an economy. On the other hand, if you don't do it, if you don't pay attention to what the retail looks like in your neighborhood, you end up degrading a community for generations. And so any of you that are from Los Angeles can, in your walkabout and your drive about town, you can tell instantly the community that you're in. You can probably tell the racial group that lives in that neighborhood. So instead of just accepting that, we need tangible tools to be able to reverse it, to make these communities quality communities regardless of income, regardless of the population that lives there, so that all the essential elements, Jim Mounja talked about this a little bit before, parks, open space, good schools, quality health care outlets, and good places to buy food, good food, um, that uh, are stores and restaurants. All of those are, are the possible potential. So I think, I mean, you, you really highlight what the opportunity is, and I, and I think in a way that's inspiring and, and offers a lot of hope. Kat, I'm hoping I can come back to you and maybe if you could expand on what you think are some of the opportunities, but also the challenges of aggregating capital to address these sorts of opportunities, and you know, you can use the experience with Freshworks particularly as an example. Sure. Um, you know, I think that the opportunities are, uh, Mary's made them very clear. There are there are so many places that there is the potential for investment and really where um, that where people can do business and, and thrive doing business in those communities. And so with within Freshworks, what we've been able to do is, is to start that conversation with some financial investors. So we have a variety of banks that have put dollars into the fund and, and I think it's good to have, you know, financial organizations, financial institutions at the table with mission-driven investors to talk a little bit about what are the social outcomes and why are we here to have that conversation going at, at kind of a larger um, level in terms of the financial investors that do make those investments into these communities. That said, um, it's definitely a challenge. So um, mission-driven investors are, are used to taking risk. Um, they're used to being in the communities that they are in, which are frequently 
disinvested communities that, that financial institutions don't often work in. Um, they are often, uh, mission-driven investors are often willing to uh, be patient with their capital in ways that, um, that financial institutions aren't. So the challenge really becomes how do you find what the outcomes are that you want to, want to see to find those, and then how do you create the financial tools given what you want from the different types of investors. So given, you know, if you want to make a large fund and you want to bring a lot of different financial institution investors together, then you have to think to yourself, well, what type of um, risk profile are they looking at? What are we intending to do? And that can really cause a challenge. So um, bringing, bringing together different types of money, um, understanding what you're going to do with that money and what profiles um, your investors are willing to tolerate, um, trying to find solutions when, uh, when you want to kind of push the envelope and, um, and you're maybe talking with a capital that, that isn't used to pushing the envelope. I think those are all challenges. But um, you know, the good thing within Freshworks, and I think that this can serve as an example for other folks, is that there's really an interest. Um, there are a lot of investors who are interested in these types of conversations. And so bringing them to the table, even if you start at a fairly conservative place, just having that conversation is, is a good place to start. Um, and then continuing to push for what you see are the most important outcomes and how you can use those financial tools um, is a continuing conversation. It is a continuing conversation that we're having it with Freshworks right now. Um, one of the things that we've done is we've launched the fund um, with a variety of different products and seen that one of them is maybe not as, as um, going out the door as quickly as possible. So we've not been able to make as many loans with it as quickly as possible as we had hoped. And so what we've been able to do is go back and have a conversation about why that's the case and what do we need to do in order to, to make that, um, that financial product work. Um, and that that's required us to sit down at the table with all of our different investors and say, here's what we thought was going to happen. Here's what the reality is. Here's why we think that you still should be in this conversation. Let's continue to talk. And it, it's been it's been a you know a, a, a long haul in that conversation, but it's also been an important one and, and, and fairly successful. Yeah, so I think that's also a really key point. The the fact that I think the the investors and the funders, the partners who've all been involved with Freshworks have all come to the table with a willingness to learn a new language, so to speak, right? So, you know, I came to the table speaking finance and investments, didn't necessarily understand the language of community development or of racial equity or all these other issues, but, you know, my colleagues brought me along and taught me what I needed to know. You know, I hopefully have, you know, shared a little bit about finance and the world of investments with them, and I think together we have been able to create something that's been able to have some kind of impact. And so I think that's an important point to highlight is, is the willingness to sort of learn a new language. Um, and so, Daniel, moving to you, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, all of us having learned this new language, <laughs> how have we now put that, put that to use in, um, in some of the projects that we've financed? Like, you know, walk us through some examples of some of the different models and how some of those different models have been drivers of uh, jobs and economic development benefit. Sure. Um, so you have some, uh, through the leadership of the endowment and NCB Capital Impact and a variety of people, you had this great tool created, right? So you've put uh, a bunch of money in a pot and created financial products and essentially created some version of a, almost a healthy food business bank. And, and then what are we going to do with that? Then we have certain conditions in the communities. We have food deserts. We have impacted communities. and sort of the, the world I live in a little is where that rubber meets the road. How do we connect those dollars and those resources into those communities in a way that's productive, uh, that generates a financial return for investors, but also is very meaningful in the impact it has? And that can be a lot of things. So let me just give you some, some basics of what that might look like in a deal and, and where that may resonate with some of what you see in your communities and some of the work that you do. So it could be something sort of maybe large and more complex, like a, a tax credit financing mechanism of seven to ten million dollars into a big supermarket where there was once a vacant lot, and that drives uh, hundreds of jobs and can have uh, hiring partnerships and connections and such, and is a driver of other retail and aggregators. Where we might put a shopping center in an area that isn't one, which is a, a fantastic transaction. It's more complicated for a slightly larger business or enterprise that can handle that type of a, a financial transaction. But it's real nice when that's also um, a local Southern California operator who uh, hires locally and spends all their money and recycles it locally and raises their families here and gives philanthropically in the community. We're really recycling a lot of that money in a local way as opposed to it all sort of flowing uh, out of state or offshore. 
we can do very small sort of traditional bank loan feeling things where uh, you might have uh, an entrepreneur who's just really uh, uh, an immigrant entrepreneur who had a 4,000 square foot store in Maywood that he just decided wasn't going to be a liquor store but was really going to be a little community market and then decided he wanted to go for number two and make it 4,000 or 6,000 square feet. Uh, really not a super sophisticated person, might have their receipts in a, in a shoe box and need some technical assistance to sort of get them to speak a little more bank language. Maybe never had a bank loan before, but at that sort of granular street front level, making a complete difference and, and, and buying into the mission and doing that. And we've done something like that as well. Um, we can make a more complicated or larger loan to a commercial developer if they have some sort of interesting or unique uh, proposition for uh, sort of incubating small businesses. There's a large uh, development we're looking at right now that's going to um, take, uh, reuse some of industrial spaces that you see in some of these areas. About half of it's going to be uh, a home to about 49 small food entrepreneur businesses, sort of. Uh, craftsmen, uh, artisanal producers of food uh, in a low-income neighborhood with a lot of local uh, food generation, but it's really going to spur small business more than a company because the development's going to be there to create a permanent way if I'm making um, special meats or cheeses or pickles or just trying to do a small little business and I'm a little too big that I can't do it in my kitchen anymore, there's no place in Los Angeles where you can go in a permitted fashion and sort of ramp up your production and grow your business and we're going to create that place here in LA. It's going to be real special. Um, that might be half of the development. The other half of the development might have some sort of kick butt nonprofit that's going to forage a variety of, of fresh foods and bring in at risk uh, individuals to prepare prepared meals. Fresh prepared meals that might go out to senior citizens or institutional clients, hospitals or school districts, and those types of things are existing as well. These are not the standard you, you, you walk up into your local bank branch and say, I want a loan for this. You're not getting that loan. You need sort of a team of people who are really tuned in uh, to those who really want to get the food and the right kind of businesses into these areas and are willing to go uh, a couple miles extra in figuring out how to get to yes. And so uh, just being that sort of healthy food business bank, we get a chance to do that. And so we do a lot of that on the loan financing side. And then we do grants for places when we think people aren't ready for debt. And uh, Kat mentioned one example that's real great, uh, mobile markets. So maybe supermarkets or some of these business enterprises and, and bigger deals, uh, they can work in impacted urban neighborhoods. But once you start getting into rural neighborhoods, lower density areas, uh, maybe the market can't really, uh, or the population can't really support uh, a large supermarket or a large multi-million dollar investment, but there's growers, there's distributors. Uh, California is an incredible agricultural producer, and so why can't we play with mobile markets and alternative forms of distribution where we can grow, aggregate, and then bring that food to areas that otherwise wouldn't? Or maybe it just looks like, um, like a truck refrigerated truck or a farm stand or something like that, but those things can be created and we can help show that they can exist not just as grant programs but as, but as businesses that can make money and employ people and bring them forward. And so all of that is sort of within the realm of what we, what we try and create. So there's a real portfolio of healthy food ideas out there. Uh, and then the trick is to prove that it's not something that just has to be grant funded, that actually these are things that can exist within the, the, the normal economic rhythms uh, in the United States and that, and that uh, we can bring more converted financial players to invest. Thank you, Daniel. So, um, you know, you talked about the various different models and the types of jobs that they create and entrepreneurship and, and all that. I think um, we oftentimes think, great, you open up a grocery store and now you bring in a crop of 120 people and you've created 120 jobs. I think the partnership with Homeboy is actually very interesting because it speaks to the need to sort of develop that crop and, and sort of plant the seeds and, and get those folks ready. So Jose, maybe it's a, a good opportunity now for you to tell us about that partnership and a little bit more about what, uh, what you all are doing with the Freshworks Fund around getting youth ready for, for right, some of these absolutely. jobs. Right, um, absolutely. You know, I was, I was a little surprised that I was asked to, to come and speak at this conference. <laughs> um, it's on poverty. So I really had to look at what can I contribute to the, to the conversation. Um, and for me, poverty equals lack of opportunity. Um, they go hand in hand. That's what it equals. Um, and what we've been able to do since, uh, since Daniel uh, and I have started to work together, um, he's been able to present op those opportunities that have been lacking for a large sector of the population. You know, Homeboy Industries deals primarily with, uh, with uh, 
those individuals that are trying to leave the, the gang lifestyle as well as those uh, individuals that are trying to reintegrate, reintegrate into society uh, from incarceration. So this is a sector of the community of the population that has really been overlooked. And you know, I've heard a lot of people today talk about um, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, but not having any boots. Um, so that's the type of population that I deal with. That's the sector of the population that I deal with, um, that lack of opportunity. Um, in the partnership that we've, uh, we've been in with, uh, with Daniel and with Freshworks, uh, what has happened is that opportunities have opened up. Um, and uh, that homeboy industry, we're looking for any opportunity for an individual to really uh, become a productive member of society. And we have seven social enterprises, and they mostly deal with food retail, with groceries uh, retail. We have a bakery, we have a, a cafe, uh, and we go out to a bunch of farmers markets throughout Southern California and selling our products. So, you know, when I became director of employment services at Home Winch, one of the things that I looked at is what industries can I really build pipelines uh, into for the population that we serve? Um, if we have these social enterprises where we train people in how to bake bread, then a natural pathway would be to a bakery. And there are a lot of bakeries within grocery stores. Um, if somebody's working our farmer's markets, um, a natural pathway for them is to work a produce department within a, a, a grocery store. And so when I was approached about working in a partnership with, uh, with Daniel and with Freshworks, I thought it was a great opportunity uh, for us to make that connect. You know, like uh, Mary said, there's been a lot of uh, why and, you know, there's the need for this. Um, but this is actually a, a, a solution that tells us how. How can we connect those individuals in low-income communities to affordable, accessible food and provide employment at the same time? Because we can bring all the food that we want into these communities, make it as affordable as we want. But if somebody doesn't have some type of income, a livable wage income, you know, for me that's key as well, livable wage income, uh, then there's that, that food is still unaffordable, it's still inaccessible to them. You know, so I think that a partnership with, uh, with the grocery industry, with, with Freshworks, with uh, organizations like Daniel's, um, it's a great way for us to make that connect, to, to really bring a, a viable, concrete solution to poverty into these low-income communities. You know, we're talking about child poverty. Uh, for me, you know, we really have to start with the parent because uh, if a child doesn't have a parent that has a livable wage job, how do we expect that child to really come out of that uh, situation of poverty that they find themselves in? Um, you know, we want to break that cycle, that generational cycle that exists within so many of the low-income communities where the parent is, in, one parent in, is incarcerated or has come out from a period of incarceration so they, they don't have access to, to, uh, to a livable wage job and thus the family doesn't have access to affordable food. So that family stays stuck in poverty and that cycle continues through each generation. Um, so this is a way for us to really look at a solution and a concrete way to connect those individuals that are in low-income communities to accessible, livable wage jobs that will then give them access to affordable, accessible, healthy food. You know, and, and, and thus, we do our part in breaking that cycle of poverty that exists in these communities. Excellent. So I don't know if you planted the question, because that is an excellent segue into one of the questions <laughs> we got, <laughs> which is, why does, um, does Freshworks ensure that funded businesses pay employees a living wage and provide a healthy work environment, i.e. provide health benefits and support unionized workers? So maybe, Daniel, I can ask you to, to touch on that and um, kind of how the fund tackled that through maybe the program guidelines and, you know, if anybody else on the panel would like to weigh in. Sure. I, I, I can start <laughs> off can and, and we can rip off that. So um, when we give loans, we don't, we don't necessarily have hard demands on wage levels, for example. But I, let, me, let me give at least a little bit of a primer of the supermarket industry and how wages uh, work there and how employment works there. So uh, generally, labor is one of the highest costs in supermarkets. So there's a substantial number of jobs. That's a good thing. The jobs are usually split between full-time and part-time. Um, Full-time folks generally are on more of a career track of advancement within the company by the Affordable Care Act and, and most company practices also carry insurance uh, and are, are sort of being groomed, groomed for promotion throughout 
uh, the company. And so amongst those full-time jobs, we feel very comfortable. We don't just lend to union or, or certain at a certain wage level. I think the different different markets uh, hit different parts of the niche, so we don't have a, a labor requirement, but we try and build in that there's livable wages and a blend of full-time and part-time. I actually am a big fan of the split model where there's a full-time component for those people who are interested in the food industry and looking to grow up and find a career pathway. I also believe, uh, myself and being an example in my youth, that, that there is a, a section of folks who are looking for regular part-time employment in their neighborhood, maybe because they're going to community college, maybe they are raising children, maybe they have other obligations that they can't put in 40 hours a week, but they can put in 20 hours a week and, and use that as a base from which to springboard off other things. So I actually really like supermarkets as an employment driver because there's some different interfaces for different types of life situations. The part-time jobs generally go to younger folks, teenagers and, and young adults, and, and sort of folks who are more primary wage earners generally pick up the full-time jobs in supermarkets. Uh, so I'd say we don't use the fund as an enforcement mechanism for labor, but we generally believe in the type of employment that supermarkets bring to impacted neighborhoods. So what I was gonna add is that the, the beauty, I think, of a, um, a, a mission-driven investment or a social entrepreneur type of a, a, a approach to increasing uh, food retail, funding these sorts of businesses, is that it gives you a lot of ways to link your objectives, your missions, your goals to filling this particular need. We have the need for the food, we have a need for healthier food, but we also have all these other things. And what um, Freshworks has done, and I should say too that there, Freshworks is an example of um, food financing initiatives, of which there are many across the country, we're happy to say. Um, really the granddaddy of them all was in uh, Pennsylvania, grown out of the, the real issue of a, a horrific food desert. So I think Philadelphia at the time had no major supermarkets, and there unfortunately are many places in the country that are like that, including places in California. Um, and so that led to a food financing initiative there, which uh, spawned interest that the Obama administration took up and has created a, a national healthy food financing initiative, which has invested about $500 million, I believe, to date. And then um, many other examples in states and regions and some more local. And then the Freshworks Fund, which I think is really a flagship model because it is such a public-private partnership. It's really got, well, actually, it's a private-private partnership. It's a, it's a philanthropic and uh, private investment partnership. And I think the beauty is that for each one of these models, there's been the capacity to add some guidelines, I think is what the, the term that, that Daniel used, but to, to be able to say, these are some things we aspire to. We don't just invest money to, to open up food retail. Lots of people do that. Banks do that. Lots of people do that. But the question is, we want to encourage a certain type of a food retail in a certain type of a place. And so we add some of these other um, aspirations onto the, the investment of the money. And not all of them get hit at every single time. And so I think the, the point that Daniel was asked, answering about whether these are all living wage union jobs, they're not all cookie cutter deals. And so some of these deals, and I'm not just speaking about Freshworks, I'm talking about some of the other initiatives too, some of them have really gone to fund very little stores, small businesses uh, owned, maybe the, the corner store strategy where you upgrade a corner store. And frankly, in a place like Los Angeles where there are eight or 900 corner stores, liquor stores, convenience stores, whatever word you wanna call them, in places like South Los Angeles, which have two or three employees, to take some of those and make them into outlets that are really selling healthy food, when they're the places that are close to where folks live, can make a huge difference in the neighborhood's economic vitality and in the health of the residents and provide a small business opportunity, which is another aspect of this work. There are myriad small business opportunities in the food system all along the chain from truck drivers and distributors and food manufacturers and um, to say nothing of, of the growers. So we, we look at all of the things that stem from the investment and see that in some instances it's the job skill, in some instances it's the wage, in some instances it's the benefit, and in some instances it hits all of those. Um, we spark new food related uh, activities with this work too. And I have to tell you, talk about riding a trend, 
food is hot. <laughs> food is like the hot thing right now. Everybody's got food shows on TV and food carts and new recipes and all the food you can possibly think about. And we're even getting young people, back to the issue of children, excited about food. So they're growing food in their schools. They're, they're merchandising and manufacturing food themselves. So I, all I wanted to say is there isn't a one-size-fits-all or it's hard to avoid food metaphors when you're talking about this stuff. I was going to say cookie cutter. Uh, there's, uh, there's, it's, there's no one size fits all with the investment, but there are just so many different types of benefits that can, can stem from them. Go. Jose, maybe like an example of some of the pathways from uh, the homeboys to the radish and how did, did their wages change at all? Or right, they did. Um, you know, the, the, the first time that uh, Daniel and I worked together, there was a new market coming into the downtown uh, LA area, actually the Arts District. Um, and, you know, Daniel was the facilitator there to make that connection, you know, to kind of uh, not mandate or require that this market employ individuals that were part of our program. But he very strongly advocated for our people. Um, and what happened as a result of that is that, you know, about a dozen people got employed in that market. Um, they all ended up in jobs that uh, on the average paid them probably about three to four dollars an hour more than um, a nonprofit like Homeboy Industries uh, was paying them at the moment. Um, so it, was a hu it made a huge impact on these individuals' lives. Um, not only on their lives, but their families. And so you get that ripple effect where now somebody could say, you know, I can afford to take a part-time job at this market so that I can go to school at night so that I don't stay in that cycle. You know? um, and so I think that those partnerships are really important. Um, one thing that I wanted to add that you know, I, I've been here uh, since maybe about 11.30 and I've heard, I heard a lot of good things um, from a lot of different people. But what, what, I, uh, what I really dr want to drive home as a point is the fact that it doesn't just take a fresh works or an emerging markets, or a homeboy industries, or policy links, or the endowment. You know, it takes the whole community to make a difference. Um, that's been my experience. You know, uh, on one of the panels that was on previously, there was somebody from YPI, somebody from St. John's, and somebody from Para Los Niños. My organization works with all those organizations because they each address a different issue with somebody that's living in poverty, with somebody that's living in a, in a low-income community. Um, you know, the mayor was here. We're working with the mayor on a fair hiring, fair hiring ordinance where individuals with criminal records are not excluded from so many jobs that they're currently excluded from. I can't make that happen. It has to happen um, because the mayor moves forward, because city council moves forward. Um, but it has to really be a community effort. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that um, individuals like, like Daniel um, see that. And when the opportunity arose, he approached us about the partnership. And so we were able to make that connect and affect these individuals' lives. And we're in the process of trying to do that for some more people coming up in, uh, early this year. So hopefully we can. But it, like I said, it takes a community, and it takes different entities. It takes the private sector, the public sector, government, everybody, the nonprofit sector, the faith-based sector. Everybody has to work together in order to make an impact on one individual's life, because that's how it happens, one individual at a time. Um, and that's been my experience in that, that only when individuals are ready to do their part, offer the opportunities to those uh, people in low-income communities, those people that don't have access to fresh food, to living wage jobs, only when everybody steps us does a difference really happen, does uh, an impact really occur in that person's life. So um, it's been a great thing, and I hope that um, through this, we can make more situations like that happen. So again, I'm sure that you're planning these questions as a great segue into the next question, which is, could the Freshworks Fund be replicated for other sectors? So for example, workforce development, healthcare, education, et cetera. And so I will open it up. Mary, I see you shaking your head, so let's wow. start down I, on that I, end. I'm not the finance person, but I can certainly <laughs> spit out a bunch of different ideas of where that kind of mission-driven investment would be wonderful. Yeah. Let's hear some ideas. <laughs> Spit out a couple. Well, all the places that folks are looking for investment in finance. I mean, you know, for those of us in the room that come from the nonprofit side of the equation and we often are thinking, you know, where does the money come from? Or for those folks who are trying to start small businesses, whether it's in, in communications and um, 
uh, media, a lot of what the young people are interested in is, is in media and communications, and they need that same sort of jump start into their careers. The same kinds of um, qualities that Daniel talked about with the small merchants are often the, the situations that we have with particularly young people who are coming out of poverty, and you, you've articulated it so beautifully, Jose, that you know, um, a lot of times folks have histories where they've been trying to avoid what the circumstances are like from living in their communities, but those, those histories are still with them. So whether it's a criminal record, whether it's not completing school, whether it's not having documentation, whether it's having a child when you're, when you're a child, all of these things can be barriers to starting your dream. And these are not the folks that are going to have a traditional credit history that's going to cause a bank to land. So you've got lots of young people who grew up in communities where there aren't banks. To talk about a food desert, that's a whole other kind of a desert. They go to uh, payday lenders and things like that. Now they try to want to get a small loan to start their music business, to start their communications business, to start their t-shirt business, mm -hmm. and there isn't anybody to do it. So I'd say any of those things. We have a long history in the housing field, but I won't go there because that's another whole arena of, of uh, social investment into to housing. But I'd, I'd stop there. See okay. what folks have. And I would maybe, Tina, hold a mirror up to yourself and, and the California Endowment, really, about the notion that health is determined by the environment in which you're in, and there are certain determinants of health, and finance is a tool by which you can impact those things. It's not just policy work, it's not just programmatic work, that we're leaving a tool on the table if finance isn't part of that, and I know that you've done a lot of pretty incredible thinking in that space. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely when you think about the determinants of health and what we think of as the building blocks of a healthy community, you can think of all sorts of arena for uh, investments, transit-oriented development, housing, um, small business, youth entrepreneurship, um, infrastructure development, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So I think absolutely there's, there's opportunity. Well, not only is there opportunity, but those things are happening. So you said transit-oriented development. There are transit-oriented yep. development funds right now that are exactly. bringing together the, all these mm -hmm. different types of funds. Same thing with healthcare. And I mean, our organizations are working together on doing healthcare funding, and we're bringing bank money into that transaction as well. So that's yeah. happening. And the question is, how do we take not only Fresh Works as an example, but these other examples as well, and continue to re replicate it out to these different ideas? Yeah. So not just maybe the traditional places of housing, uh, healthcare, and then fresh food, but where, where do we go from there with that? And scale it so you get yeah. to actually a solution instead of just another pilot program. Exactly. Tita, can I ask, ask if I can make a shameless plug before we move off, because I see that our, our time is coming to an end. And that is just for more information about any of particularly food access ideas, policy link in partnership with the Food Trust and the Reinvestment Fund, who are also really big in fresh food financing, um, have put together a healthy food access portal, which you can, act, uh, you can get to from our website, which is policylink.org. But on there, you'll find archive webinars and all kinds of information about best practices at every single aspect of this uh, equation that we've been talking about today. So it's a plug for policy, but mostly it is for you to get more information and people to talk to across the country and the things they're doing, big and small, to bring healthy food, good jobs, and revitalized communities into fruition. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. In closing, um, just uh, uh, four thank yous in addition uh, to the panel. Um, first, to, uh, to Dan Lewis and Kendra Alexander from Northwestern University uh, for researching and writing the paper that really formed a lot of the, the, the foundation for the conference and looking at uh, what the data shows in, in, in terms of what's worked, what's been effective, and where the data is still uh, unclear. Um, second, um, I want to thank uh, not only Dr. Ross, but Anne Marie Jones, um, the California Endowment. Uh, it's really an honor uh, to work with them. They're, they're, they're really emerged as many ways the leaders of uh, leading us to a, a healthier uh, California. Um, third, to the Daughters of Charity for um, 350 years of uh, commitment to addressing poverty, both in terms of addressing immediate needs and also fo following uh, in, in the uh, tradition of one of the daughters of founders, St. Vincent de Paul, also focusing uh, on the cycle of poverty and impacting the cycle of poverty, which is why Grace was formed. 
Uh, and finally, this conference was really an enormous uh, amount of work. And uh, the Grace staff, I, I think some of you met uh, Sandra Sanchez uh, and know her role. But in addition, uh, Sylvia Bermudez, uh, our general counsel, Courtney Powers, and our uh, project uh, coordinator, Mitra Majde, really, really did an, an, an absolutely enormous uh, amount of work on this and deserve uh, great thanks. So the follow-up. We started by saying that this is the beginning of a process to identify the couple of recommendations that we're going to follow up on to get done in the near term. So I want to end with that. Uh, we're going to form um, a smaller work group following up on this to help us boil down the, uh, the thoughts and, and, and recommendations and discussion from today. Uh, we'll distribute those after they've been summarized. We're going to work with the work group then to, to, to focus into the couple of things that we're going to focus on. And all of you that have been participates, participants in the conference, including those online, uh, will be uh, brought into that discussion. We really are going to uh, encourage your input. And as part of that, continuing, continue to participate in the discussion at hashtag NPovertyCA, hashtag NPovertyCA. Thanks very much.